What's up, Junkie Nation? Gorgeous George and Goes are back with another superstar from the sport of mixed martial arts. Today we get to talk to Paul Bunyan. He's uh, <laughs> in a compression chamber or something. He's probably going to mow some pancakes later, put his own, his, uh, his, uh, <laughs> never mind. It's Julian Marquez, the Cuban Missile Crisis. We love that beard, though. I know. You can't beat that. I wish I had, I wish I had one of your guys' shirts. It would probably fit the Paul Bunyan thing. Can you guess who? <laughs> No, that would be cool. Come yeah. out with an axe. That yeah. I like how goes looks like Paul Bunyan, and and you look like you want to be a, a Tiger Woods. You know, <laughs> got the puma line. I see you. I see you. Um, I don't know. Are any of you in the mood for one of them big old lumberjack breakfasts now? All this Paul Bunyan talk and plaid t-shirts and beards. Oh, for sure. Mm -hmm. I've been on a diet for a while. I'm, I'm down to to destroy up some pancakes. Maybe waffles, some eggs, bacon. So you're in a hyperbaric chamber, you said, right? Correct. And uh, what's happening right now? You're recovering from the workouts. Yeah, it's a recovery. So what it does is it just pushes extra oxygen into your body and helps you with your recover. So you you recover, you know, six to ten times faster than the average, you know, daily recovery that you have. Um so it gets all the oxygen into the hard to get or hard to reach places in your body. And it's really good. I do it a lot, um, a few times a week, uh, especially during camp. So it camp in not even camp, just training is very difficult. You know, we, we train a lot as a mixed martial artist, you know, morning, night, physical, and we need our bodies to keep up with the training regimen that we have. And this is one thing that I found that can give me a couple extra practices a day just by coming into one of these hyperbaric chambers. Are you in Vegas now, or are you, do, are you still in Denver? I'm in Denver right now. What's the training layer like for the, with the altitude? How long did it take to you to, uh, to adjust? Oh, it took me a few weeks to adjust to the altitude. It was, it was real weird because I never was tired. I just couldn't breathe. It, mm -hmm. was, it, was, an awkward, it was an awkward feeling. Um, I was trying to figure out why. I was trying to figure out why it was like that, but it's just the altitude just takes your breath away. Mm -hmm. I, I have a dumb question, actually, Julian. So where you're at right now, is it ever one of those things where like, you know, when you go into cryo, you have a certain time limit because if you're in there too long, then it becomes harmful, right? Can you like if you were to fall asleep right now, would it be harmful to be in there for too long or anything? No, not at all. I actually, I normally fall asleep and take naps in here, and I, I don't want to say you're like delirious because you're you're not. You know exactly where you are, but your body feels definitely like all woozy for a second, and then you're good to go. But uh, there's people that do sleep in here. You you want to keep it in for an X amount of time. Um, you don't want to stay in it for a long period of time. Uh, but I don't know the harm that it would do. Is there a – if you didn't feel comfortable, does someone have to let you out from the outside or you can let yourself out? You guys there? Yeah. Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Did you guys uh, – I said, I said if, if something were to happen in there, could you let yourself out or does someone have to let you out from the outside? Uh, I can let myself out. So, as, as you can see – there's a pressure gauge right around here. There's a release nozzle to release the pressure. I have an emergency push, and then I could just zip myself out. Um, so this is one of those. Uh, it's it's it wouldn't be bad. You would have to if I have to let myself out. I have to release the air a little slower mm -hmm. because the worst thing that can happen is when you release the pressure in here, it could pop and it could just hurt your eardrums. Yikes! So you'd have to release it slowly. Mm. So, uh, I took a look at your record, you know, four and two, you could go to five and two here in the UFC. Um, but so much time off because of injuries. And I noticed, I guess almost a little bit of bad luck. A lot of guys have canceled on you. You had to pull out a one, but most of the time it looked like they pulled out on you. Has that weighed on you mentally? Like, like just the fact that, you know, we met you at 26, I think, or 27, and now I, I think you're in your early 30s. Um, uh, how has that affected you over the years? I mean, it doesn't really affect you that much. You just 
you know, you just, you just got to roll with the punches. That's part of the game. That's part of the fight game. Like prior to the UFC, there was people that was always canceling and moving things out. And it's, it's rough because, you know, you put all this time into work and then it's canceled and you got to do something else. And lo and behold, like, here's another camp, here's another situation. And it's one of those, uh, it's one of those things you just got to keep a clear head. Like the end goal isn't to just keep fighting to that day and then finish that day and then take off for three months and get back in it. The end goal is to continue going to get a better fight, to get a better matchup, to get better, you know, recognition to a better card. And, you know, and the UFC does take very good care of you uh, when things like this happen. I mean, look at the card that I'm on with the opponent that I'm on. It's a, it's a great opportunity for me as a mixed martial artist. Yeah. Um, well, as long as you're in a positive state, that's great. Um, because, like I say, from the first time I saw you fight at Dana White Contender Series and then you being on the show, I thought, man, this is the type of guy the UFC is looking for. Tall kid, good looking kid, can talk a good game, you know, and goes out there. His fun's not ne- sorry, his fights never suck. And, and, um, honestly, like, uh, you know, your main card material in my eyes, we just got to keep that momentum going, stay healthy, and, and, uh, you'll, you'll be there. You know what I'm saying? No, oh, absolutely. You know, I've main carded a lot of, started the main card on a lot of cards, um, in my career in the UFC. And the thing is, it's just, you know, unfortunate events happen it doesn't mean that doesn't take away from who i am it doesn't take away from my skill set doesn't take away from my entertainment value it's just that's how things go like after so many canceled cards like if you keep fighting four times a year then the average fans gonna know who you are but if you're like me and you go for a fight and then you don't fight then people forget about that fight and then you can't do any highlight reels or anything like that then it's it's very hard to stay in front of the fans for them to push you more and more. But anytime I'm in front of the fans, they always love the, they always love the, the Cuban missile crisis out there. I give everybody what they want to see. I'm always entertaining. And, you know, I, I speak very well when it comes to mic time. So people love, they hate me, but they still talk about me. Julian. So, you know, sometimes you'll see uh, in sporting events, they'll put on, a movie like Rocky, right? Or a movie like Hoosiers to inspire people. Tell me about the Kansas City Chiefs and what they did. Did that almost get you jumping and and wanting to put in that extra time? Like, did that fire you up for your fight? Oh, absolutely, man. Look, being born in Kansas City, I went, you know, 20, 20 plus years of watching them lose to where now we're finally at the top of the food chain, we're taking home titles, we're winning the Super Bowl, and it just shows you, you know, there are going to be rough times, but if you keep on believing and you keep on pushing, it's going to motivate you, and you'll get the you'll get the win. I mean, no one gave any of them credit this entire year, and it's kind of like my entire, like, career. No one gives you credit. No one cares. Everyone's going to put you down. Everyone's going to say this, that, and the other, but when it came time to Super Bowl time, they won. When it came time to saying they weren't going to be in the playoffs, they got to the playoffs. When they say they weren't going to beat this team, they beat this team. And then the next thing you know, we're, you know, Super Bowl champs, you know, two in the last five years with three appearances. That's just incredible. And that just motivates me more now hearing that we're Super Bowl champs. Julian Marquez goes out March 4th, gets the hype it up, and then there's a UFC card in Kansas City. It's just an amazing year for Kansas City. Julian, so I know a lot of those players when, uh, you know, winning a Super Bowl, a lot of them have done that before, but this one kind of felt a little special. Uh, What about for you? If you were to look throughout your career, what would you say is your marquee moment, your marquee fight that uh, that you always look go back and look at for inspiration? You know, I haven't really like gone back to look at my fights for inspiration. You know, I I know like. When I look at the Gregory Rodriguez fight, uh, I look at that and see my, my ways of improvement. I'll look at my amateur fight and look at ways of improvement. But I don't ever look for inspiration because that's who I was in the past. And I'm not trying to be that person ever again. I'm trying to be better. So I look at the opportunities that I have. I'll look at my teammates for inspiration. Like 
right now I've been out here at Factory X, so I've been watching a lot of Chris Gutierrez and Jonathan Martinez, a.k.a. Pedro. I've been watching them and how they're able to control the range, how they're able to use the kicks, the knees, the elbows, the movement, the balance. And those are what really bring motivation out for me is seeing the people that I train with and the people that I support to succeed. And it helps encourage me to push knowing that we're under the same lineage that I can potentially have the same type of, you know, showing that these guys have. Mm-hmm. And then, so, you know, on that topic of, of teammates, when I saw your opponent, you know, obviously in my head, I start breaking it down and then I, I got maybe 20 seconds and I go, you know what? Julian has trained with so many different types of fighters and fought so many different types of fighters that I just feel like, are you, are you at the point now where you just, when you see an opponent, there's not really much they can bring to the table that you haven't already seen, whether it be in a fight or in training? Absolutely. I mean, I, I've traveled. I've actually trained uh, in 2013. I trained at the Black Zillions with a lot of his teammates. Um, I, I made a lot of friends with the teammates that he went to. I've trained at American Top Team with Yoel Romero and Michelle Batista. I've trained Glory MMA and Fitness. I've trained at Syndicate. I've trained at Extreme Couture. I've trained here now at Factory X. And, and these are just times. And, like, you see many styles over the years. And there's really not that many styles that you're like, oh, that's unique. Like, you can't ever train. Them. Unless we're going against, like, a, uh, a Ryan Hall where you know, like, he's number one of 50-50 and we're looking for ankle hooks or heel hooks and things like that. It, it's just... Like, with the training that I have, I've been around the world. I've trained with some of the top-tier people from around the world, and I've seen all these styles, and it's just more about being composed and more about perfecting my style and making my style what it is. If I start focusing on what the other person does and and worry about what the other person does great, this, that, and the other, then it deflects from what I can do. When you come out next week, are you going to – Repeat the process, stay at the porn house, or are there new accommodations this time? This time, this time, I, I'm not staying at the porn house. Last week, or last fight camp that was supposed to happen, uh, I had to come out uh, a week prior, and the porn house was open, so I got to hang out there, and it was pretty fun. Uh, shout out to Kendra for setting me up with that. She's been a, a huge support in my career since the, the beginning, and it, it, it's amazing to have her on my side and, and to help me out and put me inside the porn house. So, if you do look at any of the uh, porn sites and you see a house, you can guess which one I stayed at. That's mm-hmm. the fun part. But, uh, no, this time I just got an Airbnb. I'm going to bring my team out. We're going to be close to the PI, and we're going to uh, have our own little area where we can cook and hang out and relax and not have to worry about, you know, the struggle of being in a hotel. I, I guess I was going to ask you that, too. Um a lot of fighters do choose to go Airbnb style and get away from the hotel. What's your official reason for that? Well, I love that the UFC puts us up in the hotels. I love that, um, you know, all the fans and stuff that are there. But I just, I like to have my team and I like to be secluded. I don't like to like walk down the stairs and there's like a bunch of people coming bombarding you, which is amazing after a fight. But before the fights, you're cutting weight, you're doing all this and, you don't get the Wi-Fi so you can play the video games that you want to play. You don't get just the, the personal space and the, the entertainment that you have. Like, I think our Airbnb has a pool table. We have a foosball table. We have all TVs in our room. Um, we have one little kitchen, one giant kitchen. It's a giant bathtub, jacuzzi bathtub to help cut weight in. And just everything I need is right in one under one roof, and it's away from everybody. And it's just more relaxing, and it feels more welcoming like I'm at home instead of, being inside of a hotel room yeah all right i've always enjoyed the hotel experience i um we went to bellator but goes and i haven't traveled much a starting with the pandemic and then b we kind of host watch alongs for pay-per-views and so we don't get to as many shows as we used to but we went to bellator a couple weeks ago and we were actually at the fighter hotel and man like it it kind of rejuvenated me a little bit, just kind of being around. You're right, though, about one part. It's it's post-fight that's really, really special. But, you know, a few times we were running into people pre-fight as well, and 
And uh, but you know, I, I also know times have changed too. No, absolutely. That's uh, I remember when I went to uh, UFC Indianapolis when Zach Cumming made his first professional debut in the UFC in the octagon, and uh, I should say professional debut, his uh, UFC debut. And I remember walking in with him, and he was bombarded with like 20 different fans. One fan had all like action figures and bobbleheads of different fighters that were on the card. Another fan had all these just binders of different photos. Like fans are diehards, and I love them. We wouldn't be as successful as we are without them. But sometimes it's a bit too much whenever, you know, you – you're cutting weight or you're tired or you just want to relax or you just want to walk down and grab a, a drink of water or go to your you know training area and there's people just kind of hoarded outside during the fight week. This guy is uh, kind of your style. I mean, I know his last fight was a submission win for him, but really other than that, when he's finished, he's, he's thrown hands, you know, or ground and pounded or whatever. Um, do you have preferences at this point or, or, or do you like mixing it up with someone like you who likes to be violent and throw hands too? Well, look, they need entertainment. We have such a spectacular card on March 4th um, with the, you know, John Jones coming back and Cyril Gaon going there. And it's, it's a huge card and they want to make sure people are entertained. So they put Julian Marquez in that card and they want people to watch it. So that's why they put me on the prelims. And people are going to tune in. They're going to know that Mark and I are going to bring it. They're going to know it's going to be exciting. It's going to be a bloodbath. And it's going to be ending with a highlight reel with Julian Marquez on top. I look forward to it. Thank you, as always, for the time. And uh, hopefully your eardrums are all right. Uh... <laughs> hey, they, I popped them. I yawned a couple times in here, and it finally popped. So we're good to go. Yeah, I meant from, from Goz's questions and his, you know, <laughs> his scratchy voice. Sometimes people yeah. complain, but no, seriously, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Safe, uh, safe weight cut, safe travels. We'll see you in a few weeks, Julian. Thank you so much, guys. I appreciate you.